Hi everyone, my name is Dale Blassingham and I'm an assistant professor of practice here in the School of Journalism and as I'm sure uh, you probably all know by now, your professor Deborah Price uh, has strep throat and her voice is not feeling up to it so I'm uh, pinch hitting and uh, providing my voice uh, for uh, this week's lecture on digital photography. So uh, this is one of my favorite topics to talk about so I hope you enjoy it um, and you'll want to make sure and pay attention at the end. There will be uh, Ms. Price will be getting in touch with you in terms of a practice assignment in terms of this as well. So uh, let's talk a little bit about photography and uh, get into kind of the nitty gritty of both using a DSLR to take uh, photos like this or um, using your phone to take just as nice a quality of photos as well. Um, so let's start first with the DSLR and I know some of y'all may have zero experience with the DSLR and that's fine. Um, you don't have to use a DSLR to take great photos. I'm sure many of y'all have taken excellent photos with your phone, uh, but there is kind of a science behind using a more expensive, more complicated camera. Uh, and so I want to walk you through that process. And really the goal when you're using one of these higher end cameras, you eventually want to make it to where you can shoot in manual mode. Uh, it's a little uh, intimidating to get to that process, but once you do, you'll never want to shoot in anything else. Uh, because you have total control over the image. You have total control over the situation uh, and you learn that you're actually in charge of the camera. It's not the other way around. So um, there are three main considerations when you are shooting in manual mode or just using a, DL, a DSLR in general. And don't let this uh, chart kind of confuse you. I just wanted to explain that we're going to be talking about shutter, aperture, and ISO. And I'll explain all of this uh, here uh, in a little bit more detail um, after we get done with these three considerations. But really these three things all play off of each other and they're all going to affect the shot that you get, um, how it turns out, how it ends up looking. So um, I'm going to use some of my photos here as examples for some of these. So I want to start first with shutter speed because um, for me that's oftentimes the most important of these three uh, considerations. I love shooting long exposure photos um, that is directly uh, controlled by shutter speed. So all shutter speed means is it's the amount of time that the shutter stays open. So it's the amount of light the camera is collecting basically. It's amount, the amount of the scene that the camera is collecting. And if you have any movement at all it's going to show up if you have a longer shutter speed. So for instance um, this is a four second exposure here meaning the shutter stayed open for four seconds. Um, I took this uh, shot right outside the Washington Monument, obviously. Um, those blurred lines are the traffic going by. So those are headlights moving through, and that's the effect I wanted um, with that. So with a shot like this, um, you want the shutter to be open for about the amount of time that it's going to take for the subject to move through your scene. So in this case, um, this traffic was not moving very fast. It took about three to four seconds for the car to go by. I think this might actually be two cars that went by at one time. So I set the shutter for about four seconds for that. Um, here's a shot I took of a creek at Glacier National Park. So you'll notice the water is the movement in this shot. Um, and I wanted that kind of milky smooth uh, a feel with the water. It would obviously look way different if you just took this shot with your phone or if you had a very short shutter speed on this. Um, it would look more like you traditionally would think a creek would look, but I wanted this effect in particular. So for this shot, I had the shutter open for 10 seconds. Now I tried it at 8 seconds, I tried it at 13 seconds, I tried it at 15 seconds. Um, 10 seconds turned out to be the best. And you'll notice that even though the shutter is open for that long, nothing else in the scene is moving. That's why everything else is crystal clear. Um, the trees obviously aren't moving. The rocks aren't moving. It's just the water that's moving. So that's really key to getting um, a shot like this using your shutter. Um, another key is have, making sure you're on a tripod because you can't be moving the camera around at all. So you hit the, you hit the, uh, the button to start the photo and then you don't touch the camera for however long you have the exposure open. Um, here's another example, kind of a longer exposure. This is 15 second exposure. Uh, so again, I hit the button and then the camera sits there and works for 15 seconds and then starts processing the shot from there. 
Um, this was a waterfall in the Snake River at a state park in Idaho that I took. Um, and I really wanted it to be smoothed out. So this one, again, I tried all the different exposures. Um, this water was flowing incredibly fast. Um, and it just turned out that 15 ended up being the best exposure for this. And just to show you the difference, um, here's what that actually looks like. So this is having the shutter only open for one 1250th of a second. So that's an incredibly fast exposure. And if you want to capture the water, making it look like it's splashing up like that, you need to have as short a shutter as possible. So it just totally depends on what you're trying to accomplish. You can see I haven't edited this photo. The exposure is kind of dark and stuff like that. But I wanted you to focus on the water there to see the difference between a very short shutter speed and a long shutter speed. And then you have astrophotography, which is my favorite thing to do. The majority of your astrophotography shots like this uh, are going to be 30 second exposures. And that's typically the longest you would have any sort of uh, shutter open for on most DSLR cameras. The longest mine can go is 30 seconds. So um, again, you press the button and for 30 seconds, you just sit there and let the camera do its work. Um, then it processes, then you take it into editing and, and all of those things to get um, shots like this. This was at about 2.30 in the morning at Glacier National Park at Logan Pass, which is the darkest point in the park. Um, and, you know, walked out of the car, got out of the car, perfectly saw the Milky Way up above me and, and thankfully was able to capture that uh, with my camera as well. So that's shutter speed. Then you have aperture and aperture goes, uh, aperture depends on the lens. So I'll say that. Um, and some lenses are better than others. Um, but what that does is it controls your depth of field. So this is going to affect how the picture looks in terms of things that are in focus in the foreground and blurry in the background. So here's a picture I took at Petrified Forest National Park. You can see I wanted the piece of petrified wood to be in focus. And then I wanted the background and all the clouds to be, uh, in, uh, blurred a little bit in the background you probably recognize this as portrait mode because your iphone allows you to do um, shots like this on the phone but you can also do this on a, a dslr using your aperture so you would want the aperture very low uh, meaning like f 2.0 or f 1.4 again we'll get to these uh, to that chart here in a second so you can understand what that means. But the lower your lens can go in terms of aperture, the more expensive it's going to be because a lower aperture number uh, usually means a more high quality lens. You would raise the aperture uh, if you wanted everything to be in focus. So that's how that equation goes. And then finally, the third consideration you have to think about is ISO. And all ISO does is it controls the sensitivity of light. Um, so here's a picture I took at Glacier National Park. These bighorn sheep uh, came up to my car. And so I didn't really have time to like focus. I was, I just pulled my camera out, stopped, put the car in park and just started shooting. Um, and I had auto ISO on. So a lot of photographers will just keep auto ISO on um, and let the camera make that decision of what the proper ISO is based on what you've set the aperture at and what you have your shutter speed at. Um, you can see this ISO is actually very high. Um, ISO 100 is the lowest it can go, and that's really where you want it to avoid any noise, if at all possible, in your photo. So you can see there's a lot of noise. It starts to get kind of grainy. One, the shot isn't in perfect focus, so that kind of bugs me. Uh, but two, um, you, you notice you know the, the colors aren't as vibrant. They are quite grainy. Um, and that's what happens when you have a high ISO, ISO shot. Now, sometimes you have to. Um, hopefully, you don't have a lot of noise or a lot of grain in the shot. But um, you tend to get those anything more than maybe six or 800 ISO. So here's, again, a look at... Or 800 ISO, I'm sorry. So here's a, a look again at that, uh, that triangle of all these things play together. Um, I talked about shutter speed. So again the longer the shutter speed. So we're only at an eighth of a second up there. If we keep going to full seconds, you're going to have those blurs in motion. And then where you can clearly see the, the person moving there, one five hundredth of a second, one one thousandth of a second, when you have a lot of motion and you don't want any blur at all, you want your shutter open very small amount of time. Um, for aperture, I mentioned the lower the number, 
the better the aperture or the more depth of field you're going to have, the higher the higher the cost of the lens. Um, it gets a little confusing and I don't want to get too far into the weeds on this, but the lower the aperture number, the actual bigger the aperture. So uh, don't let that confuse you. All you need to know is the lower the number there on that F number, um, the more depth of field you're going to have. Uh, and also the brighter the shot's going to be. So then ISO, same thing, the lower the number, usually the less noise you're going to have in that. So if you notice on the inside of this triangle, um, the slower your shot or the, uh, yeah, the longer your shutter is open, the brighter the shot's going to be, the lower your aperture, the brighter the shot's going to be. And then the higher your ISO number, the brighter that your shot's going to be. So if you have a really, um, if you have a really show slow shutter speed, uh, for a shot, let's say four seconds, uh, meaning the shutter is going to be open for four seconds, you know, that that's going to be a pretty bright shot. So you're probably not going to be able to have it down at 1.4 or two. You might have to go for four. You definitely would want the ISO set at 100 for that. And if it's at daytime, you're probably actually going to have to put a filter on your camera because it's just so bright. And that would be like essentially putting a pair of sunglasses uh, over your camera to help you get that shot that you want. So these are constantly in adjustment. So um, you change your shutter speed, you're probably going to have to adjust your aperture and your ISO in order to accommodate for the light. You change your aperture, you're probably going to have to change your shutter and your ISO to a, a, a to account for the amount of light that's coming in. So that's really important because that's really the key of manual mode. Once you figure out this little triangle here, and it took me a long time to, to get this down. So don't, if you're overwhelmed, don't, you know, don't panic over that. Um, it's a lot of information to take in. It's especially hard to do if you're not actually out practicing with a DSLR. But once you get this down, um, it's the light bulb turns on in your head and all of a sudden all of this makes sense and you start doing your adjustments. Um, and those adjustments are going to be what saves your photos, uh, because the light is going to affect the exposure and how the, the photo actually turns out. So that's the kind of the equation part of it. The other thing you have to worry about or think about is lenses. Um, lenses are where you, one, if you get into photography and you want to start using a DSLR lenses are going to be where you spend the majority of your money and um, because lenses can get incredibly expensive. Um, and there's just things to consider like uh, what lenses do I need? How do, what lenses take, what type of photos? So I want to, as simply as possible, explain a couple things about lenses. Um, the first thing to think about if you're considering a lens or if you just see a lens uh, being able to get some information from that. And the first thing is focal length. So every time you see a lens, it will say something like 35 millimeter or 50 millimeter or 200 millimeter, or maybe 70 to 200 millimeter, something like that. That is information on the focal length. It's telling you what the image is going to look like uh, when you use it for a shot. So here is an example of what all of these different types of lenses standing in the same exact shot or same exact place, this is what it would look like if you saw it through that lens. So something like a 12 millimeter and an 18 millimeter lens, those are what are known as wide angle lenses. So you see um, from that point, you're gonna get more of the shot, more of the scene in the shot using those wide angle lenses. When you start getting to 24, 35 or 50 millimeter lenses, that's closer to what the eyeball actually sees. So. Um, if you think 35 millimeter lens or a 50 millimeter lens, um, you can pretty much rest assured that what is in your field of view, that's going to be fairly close to what you're shooting there. And then once you start getting into the triple digits, you know, hundred millimeter, 200 meter, millimeter, 300 millimeter, those are what we know as telephoto lenses. Those are those really big lenses that you oftentimes see photographers using, um, that, you know, look massive. Um, those are the, you know, we would think of them as if you're shooting something from very far away, you're going to need a telephoto lens. So you can see down there that 300 millimeter, basically the only thing you get in the shot is that barn when you're using a lens that big. So for people who do wildlife photography um, and stuff like that, you have to invest in a really high dollar uh, telephoto lens in order to do that. The other thing to keep in mind is the difference between prime and zoom. 
and so here's just a, a example of two, uh, I believe these, these are ultrasonic lenses, but they're used for cannons. Um, so you see the one on the left just says 50 millimeters. So that one is going to be 50 millimeters every time you use it. The one on the right is a 24 to 70 millimeter lens. So that's what's known as a zoom lens. The one on the left is a prime lens. Prime means that's it. It's a 50 millimeter lens. You can't adjust it. The view, the focal length is going to be the focal length every single time you use that. Um, but a zoom lens, you have, you notice you have an extra ring on that lens for adjustment. That means you can go from a 24 millimeter shot, which is the more wide angle lens. So you get more of the, more of the scene in the shot. And as you turn that ring, it's going to go up to 70 millimeters. So you're going to have less of a field of view, uh, but you can see a little bit more in the photo. So it's all dependent on what you want out of the photo. Some people swear by prime lenses. Some people swear by zoom lenses. I personally have both. I prefer to probably shoot on a prime lens, but it is nice to have that advantage of being able to um, have multiple focal lengths on your uh, on your camera as you're as you're out shooting stuff, especially if you're moving a lot while you're shooting. So it all just kind of depends as you get into photography. If you pick up photography as a hobby, um, you'll very quickly learn which of these two camps you fall in. So it's great to use DSLRs, right? They're going to take amazing photos. Uh, it's a great hobby. I love it. It's one of my favorite things in the world to do. Um, however, it costs a lot of money. And so not only do the bodies cost money, um, you have to start investing in lenses. You have to start investing in tripods. It's a time investment. Um, I very much think it's a worthy investment, but I realize not everybody shares that opinion. So um, saying that, there's a reason why a lot of people use our phones for photography. And I use my phone for photography a lot. Please do not... Uh, think that I, you know, am too good for phone photography. I love the photos my phone takes, um, especially the newer iPhones and Androids take amazing photos. So I do want to walk you through a couple of ways to take better photos um, with your phone in particular, because there are some um, things to keep in mind. This also applies to DSLR photos, uh, but these mostly can apply to uh, your iPhone shots and just things to think about in general in terms of when you're taking photos. The first thing to think about is the light, mostly the outside light, especially if you're, you know, if you're outside and taking these photos. Um, there is oftentimes a assumption that a clear sunny day is the best lighting for a photo. And that's actually not the case. Um, the sun, especially on a cloudless day, um, can really affect uh, all of those things, if we talked about that triangle, the aperture, the shutter, and the ISO, um, you're going to be doing a lot of adjusting with that. And you probably already noticed when you take photos into the sun on your phone, sometimes you get that little green circle on your shot, on your uh, photos, uh, or they start to look washed out. Um, so the sun can really play havoc with your, with your shots. Likewise, if it's super cloudy, the shot might be kind of gray or dull. Um, you might not have that pop. Uh, in terms of the sky and the and the foreground. Uh, so really, the ideal time to take a shot is what's known as golden hour. Um, there are two golden hours every day, and they're not always great. Um, but golden hour is typically that time right around sunrise and right around sunset. So for instance, these are not my photos. I wish they were. Um, this is a photo from Poland, I believe. Um, so this would be an example of a sunrise photo. So you can see the ground's kind of covered with snow. Um, there's not any dramatic clouds or anything in the sky, but you can see how that golden hue kind of adds to all the lights and everything like that. So it really uh, makes that photo pop. If you took this in the middle of the day, um, this would be a dramatically different photo. Likewise, golden hour also has an impact on people as well. Um, so here's a photo of a little boy um, and you can see the the pop in the background. You can see the, the uh, rich background and rich... Um, pop, I keep say, using that phrase, but that's how I describe it, that happens between him and the background. You also notice this is a, this is a low aperture shot because um, the boy and the chicken are in focus and all the, the wheat or whatever that is in the background is blurry. Um, so this is a really great photo and it's taken in golden hour. You can see that kind of golden yellow hue around um, the little boy as he's uh, holding that uh, chicken for there. So 
if you can take photos during golden hour, those are, there are reasons why photo shoots take place during those two times. Um, the second thing to think about, and this one's really tough for students because, um, we tend to see students don't want to get close to their subjects if they're taking photos. Um, it is kind of awkward. I totally admit that. Um, but you're generally going to have better photos the closer you get to a subject. Um, it all kind of depends on the look that you're going for, obviously. Um, but I would encourage you to get right up in there and take photos, um, especially if you're using a DSLR and a wide angle lens. You have to get super close to someone in order to get, um, you know, the good definition of their face. So um, close ups of people um, are generally way better than, you know, maybe a mid torso up shot definitely better than a full body shot, depending on what it is you're going for. Um, but you, you see more of the eyes, you see more of the expression in the people. Um, so, you know, I love close ups of people. I think they're amazing photos and oftentimes they're way more powerful in my opinion than, um, the standard shot that you might get if you're standing three to five feet away from someone. Yes. It's kind of awkward to get really close to them, but if they're agreeing to take a photo, they probably, you know, they're already feeling a little awkward anyway. So, um, you might break the ice in a way and just say, sorry, I'm going to get real close. So I want to get make sure and get a good photo of you. This also applies to animals. So, um, you know, this is a way better photo than 10 feet away of a fox. Now I would say this photographer probably had a telephoto lens, um, and is nowhere close to this animal. You have to be safe when you're, uh, taking photos, but, um, that would be an example. You, you feel the eyes, uh, you feel the glare of this Fox. And that would be a def, it would definitely be a different photo if, if it was taken from further away. Um, here's a super close up of an elephant's eyeball. Um, uh, it looks like you're standing right next to the, to the elephant. Again, I'm assuming this photographer had a telephoto lens in order to get this shot, but I just really love, um, close up shots. And these also apply to flowers too. So you can tell this is a low aperture number because the bulb of the flower is in focus and then all the petals are blurry or out of focus. So you can start to see how all those things come into play in order to take great photos. Um, and especially with flowers and people and plant and pets, uh, if it's safe, um, don't be afraid to get up there and, and take a close up shot. The other thing to uh, one other thing to keep in mind is perspective. Um, we oftentimes only think about what we're seeing right in front of us, right? We keep that perspective in mind. Well, I'm standing up and I'm looking straight ahead. So the only perspective I have right now is what's in front of me. We oftentimes forget that looking up can equal great photos. So here's an example from a forest uh, where you see this tree has a really cool curve to it. Um, there's no way you're going to gather a photo like this. Um, from far away. You have to take it from this perspective in order to do that. Um, so don't be afraid to look up and see if the photo or maybe crouch down to get that shot um, of something low to the ground, right? Could you put your phone or your, your camera close to the ground uh, in order to get a perspective, even if something isn't very high in the air. Likewise, don't forget to look down too. Looking down, um, especially if there's something where reflections might come into play, can take some really great photos or can result in some really great photos. And then the last thing I want to talk to you about in terms of taking better photos is to consider the background. I love this picture right here. Um, I wish I took this photo. Um, the outfit perfectly matches the background. So it's a very simple background. You've got the black wall with her white top and then you've got the white wall with her black bottom. Um, the balloon is white going against that. I just, I love the simplicity of this photo. And a lot of times the background we don't think about in terms of what makes a good photo. We're so focused on the, the object of what we're, we're shooting, um, that we don't consider the background. So I love this photo in particular. Some photographers really love busy backgrounds. So, you know, they're what's known as either city photographers um, or they, they just love shooting people, right? So if you're in a big city and you love shooting people, you're almost always going to have busy backgrounds. That's okay. Um, it's just, a, it's a different style of photography that you eventually get used to. Um, I'm more of a nature or landscape photographer, so I prefer really simple and clean backgrounds. Um, this is not my photo. I just want to be clear, but, um, you know, I love shooting beaches. I love shooting horizons and, 
recognizing what's in the background also helps you uh, as you start to develop the look of the photo because what we want to avoid are these types of shots and we've all fallen victim for to these shots where you have the crooked horizon where it looks like the you know the water is falling off the face of the earth um, so if you're keeping the background in mind you're going to notice that that horizon is straight um, because otherwise a lot of times if you don't think about it um, you get home and you're like, man, I just completely butchered that shot because I wasn't paying attention to the background. I did that the other day at the Grand Canyon. I was shooting a guy on a mule who was coming down a trail, and I wish I would have had this photo in here. Um, and I wasn't paying attention to the horizon. I was so focused on getting the shot of the mule that the background is like almost at a 30-degree angle. It looks horrible. So um, I kind of ruined that shot by not thinking about the background. So that, that brings us to techniques of composition, which is really important. Some of this is going to be a reminder that we covered in FDOM, for those of you who had me for FDOM. Um, but um, you should be keeping composition top of mind every time you take photos. Um, the best and most simplest, simplest rule is just simply the rule of thirds. So it doesn't matter whether it's vertical or horizon. It's dividing up the... Um, vertical aspect of the photo into thirds and then uh, dividing up the horizontal aspect into thirds um, and then you want your action at the quadrants where those meet or you want your photo to be lined up along those lines it's generally going to make your photo much better than just centering a subject uh, to do that so again these are not my photos I just want to be clear uh, but here's a great example of a wolf or a dog and icebergs, you can see the dog is perfectly placed at the intersection of the uh, of the quadrants there of the rule of thirds. Here's another example where sometimes you want your horizon to be what's along the line. So the dog itself is not um, at the intersection, but the horizon line is actually along that. And that can make uh, a photo much better. And then sometimes they both come into play. So here's an example of a seashell. Again, this is a low aperture shot because the sea, I, I kind of had to blow this shot up, but the seashell is in focus and the waves are out of focus there. But you can see the horizon is perfectly placed along that uh, upper third line and then the seashell is at the intersection of those lines. So if you turn the grid on on your phone, which is really simple, go to settings, go to camera and turn the grid on, you'll constantly have this grid um, every time you go to take a picture and it this just doing this alone will make you so much better of a photographer of keeping the rule and thirds rule of thirds in lot in mind um, the second technique is called leading lines um, and there are dozens hundreds of photo techniques I'm just going over kind of five of my favorites here um, but I love leading lines they're lines that lead you into what you're supposed to be looking at so you can see these lines along the side there are leading you down to the subject who's walking up the walkway in this particular shot. I love railroad shots, so you can see the railroad tracks lead you to the subject uh, who's walking along that shot there. But buildings can also be leading lines. Roads can be leading lines. So you can see those both come into play here where you've got the buildings leading you into the Brooklyn Bridge. You've also got the outer line of bricks leading you leading your eyes to the Brooklyn bit bridge. So keep that in mind. If you see some cool, especially diagonal lines or things like that, that can work as leading lines, a guardrail, um, anything along those sidewalk, um, keep leading lines in mind because it can, it can strengthen your photo or it can add a new, uh, technique to your photo. And then we've all probably seen shots like this on our friends, Instagrams or on Instagram accounts we follow. And um, I would also say this is an example of leading lines. So her uh, holding her arm back and the guy um, grabbing her hand, you can see his hand, his arm going into her arm. That's a leading line into the photo, into the subject of the photo. So those all work as leading line photos. Um, I love trying to find good framing. So here's an example. Again, this is not my, photo, uh, my photo, um, but there was a hole in a, a chain link fence. It perfectly... Uh, lined up the buildings, the cars, the road, and the railroad track. So this was a great way um, to use something that was there as a um, 
as a tool in order to make this a more interesting photo. You can use window frames to frame your photos. You can use doors to frame your photos. Um, you can use rocks. So here's an example of a, a giant rock with a um, cut out part of it that instantly frames the second rock in the photo. So that's a great way to do it. Buildings can also be framing or can be used for framing. So you can see here, this is a great perspective. So again, looking up, and this probably took quite a bit of patience to get this perfect shot, but as the plane was going by, um, they perfectly framed it in the shot from where uh, these buildings are located. Again, this would be a very fast shutter speed in order to get that plane uh, in focus like that. You know the shutter was only open for probably one two thousandth of a second in order to get that shot. If that was a slow shutter speed, it would just be a blur up on the sky. So keep those things in mind, how it all comes full circle with that. Um, symmetry can oftentimes lead to really great photos. Um, some things you have to keep in mind as you, if you want to shoot symmetry, usually it's going to be centered and usually there's going to be some sort of lines involved. So you can see here, um, I think this is a mall uh, and the levels just play perfectly to where, you know, the, the first part there is totally centered and then it's the same on either side, essentially. Um, when you get lines like this, this is a pier somewhere. This is not my photo. Um, you get, you know, basically the same exact shot on either side of it. So that adds uh, some interest to the photo. You can also create symmetry. So here's an example of a candle at a bar. Um, and they put two uh, sniffers out there, I'm guessing whiskey or brandy, uh, on either side of that candle. And they kind of created their own symmetry in terms of doing that. Again, very low aperture number to get that. Uh, background blur in this shot. And then sometimes circles or lines themselves can be used for symmetry. So here's a really creative shot of uh, a wall with holes in it leading to that bar in the middle. Uh, and it lines up perfectly to be a, a very symmetrical shot there. So that can add a lot of visual interest to a photo. And then the last uh, composition technique I want to talk about is the rule of space. Um, and to put that in perspective, here's this photo of this woman and a child. Um, you want the action moving toward the space in your photo. So the fact that they're on the left-hand side of this photo and the empty space is on the right-hand side, that makes total sense. This would be a totally different photo if she and the baby were on the right edge of the photo, still going in that right-hand direction. The photo would be kind of weird, right? Um, so you want, anytime there's... Uh, action in a shot, you typically want there to be negative or empty space in the photo to lead that direction. So here's two little boys pointing off in the distance. Um, because they're pointing to the left, you then want the boys situated on the right so that there's some space for you to draw your eye um, to go that way. Here's a, uh, a probably a, I would say this is a, a longer exposure shot um, this might be one second exposure because you can see it's a it's a very blurry shot in terms of the movement in it. Even he has blur around him, but you you can start to see again how all these come into play with these photos. Um, but the cars are moving that direction, and he's moving that direction to where we have a lot of space here on the bottom left. Um, so you want to think about that as you're putting your photos, you're composing your photos together. Um, and then here's one I found of sand, and I actually cropped this photo to make it, I think, a stronger photo. Um, if I would have shown you the original version, this hand was toward the bottom of the shot, and there was all this dead space at the top. I think using the rule of space, it becomes a stronger shot because you want your eyes drawing down into the shot with the hand at the top. So that's just my humble opinion. Uh, but I think the rule of space would have made this or made this a better photo as you see it currently cropped uh, as opposed to what it originally was. Um, so I grabbed a couple of photos from some of my classes just to critique a few things. Um, you know, public critique is a very important thing, especially if you want to do things like photography. Um, saying that there's no perfect way to do these photos. So I'm merely offering up uh, examples or critiques of what I would want in these photos. Um, but keep that in mind that your mileage may vary when it comes to these. So here's an example of a shot, um, where the lighting's a little off, obviously it's taken indoors. Um, there's nothing going on in the background. 
Um, there's a lot of headspace, so you could have some cropping. You could get this down more to a rule of thirds shot. Um, that would make this a better uh, visual and de-emphasize the fact that there's nothing going on in the background. Um, could have made this a, a better shot by moving the person outside and getting some visual interest in the background, maybe shooting it in portrait mode or something like that uh, in terms of making that a better photo. Um, now here's a shot that is outside, but again, I think the placement is what's important, right? So we unfortunately have a light pole coming out of her shoulder there. Um, we have a car on the right hand side. So it could have maybe turned her a little bit, gotten closer to where it's kind of mid torso up. So you still see the bobcats on her shirt. Um, but therefore you're only getting the trees in the background and you're not getting all the other stuff. We also don't need to see her uh, phone in her hand and her water bottle. So cropping again and, and, prod and product placement and her placement in the shot itself and using some of those composition techniques could have made this a much better photo. Um, I generally think this is a pretty strong photo. Um, it's centered though, so the rule of thirds here could have had a big play with this. We could have either cropped this more to make her hands at the intersection of those uh, quad, or those lines, the intersecting lines. It could have also eliminated stuff like the Kleenex boxes and the napkins uh, on the left-hand side of the photo. So I think that could have made this a much stronger photo. Um, here's an example where background comes into play. So there's a lot going on in this background. And then we have those crooked lines, right? So even though she's straight, the lines are crooked. Therefore, it makes the photo look crooked. There's a ton of headroom at the top, so cropping this down um, could have done a much better job. Um, it's also kind of dark, too, so I don't know that this was necessarily the best background to pick uh, in terms of a photo for an assignment, uh, but could have been better in terms of having straighter background lines, um, brightening up the subject, and then also getting rid of all the negative space or the empty space at the top, the head space at the top, Focusing more on the person, getting closer to them to do that. I generally think this is a pretty good shot. So I like that they had the person turn. Um, so where you're now getting that rule of space, I could have probably seen them maybe moved a little bit down the bench so we could have eliminated the bricks on the uh, left-hand side of the photo. Um, but other than that, I think that's a generally a pretty solid. I like the headspace there. There's a little bit of headspace, but not too much. Um, so I think that's really sharp. Um, this one looks great. This is shot in portrait mode, obviously. Um, I like that the subject's not looking directly into the photo. I think that adds a touch to it. Not so sure about the empty glass in his hand. Could have done without that. But um, other than that, that's a really sharp photo um, and, and looks really good and well composed. All of those things you can see, it's a, it's a close-up shot um, and it's got the rule of thirds in it. So I, I really enjoy that shot. Okay, so hopefully that all made sense, um, and I hope you at least got a little bit of an appreciation for what you can do, even if you're using your phone to take these shots. Um, we can all become better photographers. It just takes practice. It takes a little bit of patience, uh, and it takes some determination in terms of I'm going to work to get the best photo possible. So Professor Price will be sending you a, a practice assignment. I hope you take some of these things and put them into action um, with not just that practice assignment, but also uh, with your assignments through the rest of the semester. So thanks for uh, letting me share this with y'all. Uh, hopefully Professor Price is doing well here quickly, and I hope you enjoyed it.